Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Susan Villegas, and I'm the Training Development Coordinator at NOW, and as such, I bring you these webinars on the third Thursday of each month. If you've missed any of them, you can find replays on our website, nowfoods.com forward slash webinars, or on our NOW YouTube channel. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please use the chat bubble on your screen, submit your question, and we will respond to you with an answer by email. So we thank you for joining us today for this presentation on men's health and supplement support. And in today's 60 minute webinar, we welcome longtime industry veteran and NOW's senior education manager, Neil Levin. Neil is a nationally board certified clinical nutritionist with a diplomat in advanced nutritional laboratory assessment. In case you ever wondered what the DANLA stands for, there you go. He is a professional member of the International and American Associations of Clinical Nutritionists and also a member of the Scientific Council of the National Clinical Nutrition Certification Board. Neil also serves on the board of directors for MAHO. And on the home front, Neil provides a wealth of knowledge to our team when it comes to nutrition and dietary ingredients and formulations. And as always, Neil has some excellent information to share with us today, so please join me in welcoming Neil Levin to help us better understand how to support men's health. Welcome, Neil. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about nutrition for men, how to supplement a balanced diet. Uh, you know my credentials. I'm not going to keep them up there, but uh, I have some expertise. And uh, first of all, we're going to be seeing what other experts are saying about potential nutrient deficits for men in their diet. So first of all, Abbott Nutrition has a nutrition news newsletter, and they have suggestions of five nutrition tips every man needs. One of them is to pump up your protein. We want to prevent and reverse excessive loss of lean muscle age as we age. Lean muscle mass as we age, I should say. Number two, they suggest getting more vitamins C and E, the antioxidant vitamins. Uh, Meta-analysis in the British Journal of Nutrition said that consuming these two antioxidants helped with a balanced immune response, neutralizing free radicals, and supporting healthy coronary arteries. Number three, they suggest a healthy seafood habit uh, for cardiovascular health. The American Heart Association recommends two fish-based meals per week, selecting deep colored fish such as salmon, mackerel, tuna, sardines, or bluefish, uh, because they are richer in omega-3 fatty acids. Of course, if there's a vegan uh, like, or vegetarian like me that's not eating fish, there are other options to get omega-3. Uh, number four, they suggest easing up on refined carbohydrates and opting for whole grains. This helps manage weight, this helps with cognitive health, and it helps prevent insulin resistance, which results in excess blood sugar. So make your carbohydrates whole ones from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, whole wheat bread if you're not gluten-free, quinoa are a couple of good choices. And number five, they suggest checking vitamin D levels. Uh, remember in Chicago area, uh, you cannot make vitamin D from sunlight between late September and late March. The sun is too low in the sky. So there is no vitamin D, even if you go outside, take off all your clothes, uh, lie out there at, at, at high noon. Uh, this time of year, you can't make it. And uh, from a line from about Atlanta to LA, north of there, there are problems making vitamin D at certain times of the year uh, during the winter. Vitamin A, vitamin D you need for muscle and bone health to keep you strong, uh, bone density, can retain muscle, et cetera. Also helps with immunity. There's some other things they're not mentioning. But uh, they also say that uh, over 40% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. It, that 
deficiency rate might be higher in the elderly. And getting tests or just taking a daily supplement would be highly recommended. Now, there's also whole grain guidelines. That was one of the things that was suggested earlier. Only 8% of Americans get three servings of whole grains daily. We're only getting about a third of that and children get even less. And whole grains, of course, you need to help you feel full because they contain fiber. So look for the choices, whole, whole grain products. They don't have to be whole wheat, they could be whole grain. Uh, but this is from the USDA. Uh, uh, brown rice, use oatmeal instead of white bread, white rice or refined grain products. Those are all uh, good suggestions, but at least half the grains being whole grains is the suggestion. Whole grains also contain the, your B vitamins, some minerals, some amino acids, vitamin E, uh, fiber, phytoestrogens, which are extremely healthy. Uh, we'll actually be ending this presentation talking about phytoestrogens later. And looking at vitamin deficiencies in the United States, we're seeing a lot of them in the population. Vitamin B6, uh, over 10% with nu nutrition deficiencies, people who do not get the RDA. And of course, uh, optimal levels may be above the RDA levels, as uh, many of you know. So, uh, I'd say B6, uh, vitamin D are the two major ones for men on this list. And these kind of studies are based on the NHANES, which is a national survey done by the government of nutritional status. They lag years behind in analyzing it. And there's tons of studies that come out reanalyzing the data. But they're judging how much people are getting from dietary surveys. That means that the amount of nutrition on the labels should match the amount in the foods. Unfortunately, that's no longer true. As this slide indicates, fruits and wheat have had declines in vitamins, minerals, and protein over half a century. A protein down 6%. Vitamin C down 20%, B2 down 38% as some examples. And that trace minerals, you know, your selenium, chromium, uh, boron, etc. cetera, uh, between 1940 and 1991, the levels in the food supply fell by about three quarters in the United States and in the uh, uh, Britain. So, we're seeing that different varieties grown, different agricultural practices, uh, different storage, uh, everything combines uh, that there's not as much nutrition as the food in the foods as there used to be. So if people are using old nutrition tables to base how much of a certain nutrient in their diet, and a lot of food companies actually label the nutrition content based on USDA food tables, if the USDA isn't keeping up, then they're going to overestimate the nutrient density of the American diet. Red meat, uh, the average iron content dropped by about half, and some varieties fell by 80%. Milk lost about 60% of its iron content. Magnesium levels dropped by 10%, copper by 60%, uh, calcium loss even in Parmesan cheese. The food supply is not what it used to be. And the food labels are not accurately reflecting that decline. The other aspect when we look at diet is special diets can lead to nutrient deficiencies. Any restricted diet is restricting uh, certain nutrients in the diet. Uh, Men's Health Magazine points out the vegan diet, deficiencies of B12, zinc, iron, iodine, omega-3, and protein. And we need those things uh, to be healthy. A paleo diet, deficiencies of B2, calcium, vitamin D, 
a gluten free diet, uh, some similar things, but you also have to think about fiber and folate, especially if they're not replacing wheat with other whole grains or fiber sources. We need them for energy, weight control, blood sugar control, cardiovascular health, et cetera. Low carb diets, again, a similar one, but we're looking at issues with fiber, vitamins, antioxidants, carotenoids, phytochemicals, all our potential deficiencies here. And again, mood, weight, blood sugar, blood pressure, detox are all at risk if we don't get enough of these nutrients by eating a low carb diet. And for some people, they, they need a low carb diet or even a keto diet. Uh, that's used for uh, medical diets, originally for people with, with seizures, but now it's being used for many other conditions. And, uh, you know, there's some people who simply benefit by that, but are they replacing these, as, these nutrients, whether they're vitamins and minerals or other types of nutrients? So then Men's Health points out five nutrients that men are not getting enough of. They're mentioning vitamin D also, as we saw earlier. Uh, the blood test should be at least 30 nanograms per milliliter. 50 is better, but 30 is minimal. And to take at least 1,400 units daily if the results are lower. The RDA is 800, the daily value. So this is well above that level, almost double, is the suggestion if someone's low in vitamin D status. And since vitamin D primarily comes from animal products, sunlight only at certain times of year, and fortified foods as well as mushrooms. Uh, you will see mushrooms that have been exposed to sunlight or artificial light containing ultraviolet B rays will actually produce vitamin D. And I have seen vitamin D levels on packaged mushrooms in grocery stores, certain brands. And I mean, for example, vitamin D and prostate health, vitamin D supplementation, stabilizing PSA levels in the prostate and helping maintain healthy immune processes. And that's from the British Journal of Urology. And uh, vitamin D is unique because we can produce it from sunlight. The process is ultraviolet B radiation converts cholesterol to pre-vitamin D, which then goes to the liver and then the kidneys to be transformed into the active forms in the body. Now we can't make enough vitamin D in the skin if we are at high latitudes, farther north or farther south away from the equator. Darker skin pigment, which blocks the sunlight, Winter, which affects the sun angle and the intensity of the sunlight, and simply a lot of people don't get out in the sun, whether they're institutionalized, whether it's religious, uh, they're, whether they're working inside all day, a lot of people just don't get the sunlight. Now, the, here's a sunlight calculator when you can make vitamin D. Here we are. So when we're looking at January, February, no vitamin D production in the skin in this latitude. And it goes into March. Uh, this is not, you know, these are whole months. It's not showing you the, the fractions. At the end of October into uh, mid-March, we can't make vitamin D when we're this far north. If you're down a little farther around Florida or maybe Southern California, you might be able to make it year round, but there's more intensity in the winter. Now, this is something that uh, many people don't know. When I do lectures around the world on vitamin D, this is something I talk to people and they've never heard of this, the shadow rule guiding when you can make vitamin D from sunlight. And the rule is whenever your shadow lengthens and is longer than how tall you are, you can't make vitamin D. When the sun is at too low of an angle and your shadow is lengthened, you can't make vitamin D. You're, let's say you're six feet tall, just to use a round number. If your shadow is longer than six feet, you can't make vitamin D. Doesn't matter what time of day, doesn't matter what time of year. 
shadows too long. There's not enough sunlight. It's filtered through too much atmosphere coming in at a shallow angle. But if you're six feet tall and you have a four or five feet shadow, you can make vitamin D. The intensity of how quickly you can make vitamin D depends on how high in the sky the sun is. And I'll bet a lot of you have never heard that, unless you heard it from me. There's few naturally occurring vitamin D sources in the food supply, oily fish. But even so, wild caught salmon has five to 10 times uh, as much vitamin D as farm raised salmon. So you guys, salmon in the grocery store or the uh, restaurants and it's not wild caught, uh, you know, and some of them might claim it's wild caught, but is it? Then you're not gonna get as much uh, of the nutrients in there. And we need vitamin D not only for calcium and bones and teeth, but cell growth and differentiation and immune function, uh, cardiovascular health, et cetera. In fact, uh, there's even studies showing, and this is an accepted claim in Europe, that vitamin D supplementation helps prevent swaying and falling in elderly people, that it helps them maintain their balance and not fall down, or some people might actually break their hips and fall down because their hip is, is breaking rather than they fall down and break their hip because uh, they have weak bones. So 800 I use daily is really the minimum, and uh, that's not universal around the world accepted as a minimum. But people who don't get out in the sun, older people, institutionalized people should get at least that 800 units. And people who are obese, like a third of Americans, or have other causes that affect fat metabolism, should take at higher levels. Uh, I take 5,000 a day. I think 2,000 would be a reasonable amount for everyone to take every day, and there's no toxicity at that level. And when we're looking at vitamin D2 versus D3, the uh, National Institutes of Health and Mayo Clinic says that there, there's really no difference between D2 and D3 in terms of what we want it to do in the body. Uh, vitamin D2 is made from the sunlight shining on plant sterols, and vitamin D3 is made by the sunlight shining and, and affecting animal sterols like cholesterol or lanolin. So most steps involved in the metabolism and actions of D2 and D3 are identical according to the National Institutes of Health. So it really doesn't matter D2 or D3 you'll get the same benefits from both. They equally raise the serum 25 OHD levels and at nutritional doses, they are equivalent. If you're comparing getting 50 or 100,000 unit doses medically, there are differences, but that's not nutritional, that's medical treatment. So that's not really relevant. So the difference is lost with daily supplementation versus giving huge doses occasionally, is what the slide says. So that was the first nutrient that Men's Health says men aren't getting enough of. The second one is magnesium. Men only get about 80% of the RDA and the RDA since has gone up to 420 milligrams. So it's actually slightly less. Few men reach the RDA without supplementing. And there are supplements such as ZMA, which contain combinations of nutrients like zinc, magnesium, and vitamin B6. So you can get magnesium in there, plus you're getting other nutrients. And this is a formula that is popular with men and, and some women. This is a double blind randomized study, male athletes supplement with ZMA for eight weeks of training. They increased their levels of muscle building hormones. They increased their leg strength. They had increased levels of free testosterone, total testosterone, insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, whereas men with placebo had some decreased levels of some of these markers. 
And another nutrient men aren't getting enough of is vitamin B12 for brain health. And there are medications blocking B12 in the body, which include antacids and metformin, which are two very common popular medications that put our B12 status at risk. B12 is primarily found in animal foods. We cannot synthesize this in our bodies, so it is an essential nutrient. We're finding 15 to 20% of the population are deficient in B12 and it's higher levels in the elderly. Strict vegetarians are at risk. Pregnant women are at risk, especially. Uh, there's a number of other uh, things here. Uh, people with anemia, hemorrhage, kidney or renal problems uh, might be B12 deficient as well. And it can take months or years uh, to use up the body stores and notice that somebody is deficient. Now, the maximum amount that you can absorb via intrinsic factor, active absorption in the body from a single oral dose is no more than three micrograms. The daily value was recently lowered from six micrograms to 2.4 micrograms a day. Anything you take above 2.4 micrograms is absorbed by passive absorption, passive diffusion, at about 1%. So what that means, if you take 1,000, 1% 1 of that is 10 micrograms. If you take 10,000 micrograms, 1% 1 is 100. That's about how much you'll absorb taking B12. That is the reason why, when you look at B12 on a label, you see thousands of times the daily value of B12 on a typical label. It, it could be tens of thousands uh, times the uh, times the daily value. And that's not harmful and you're only absorbing about 1% of it. So when you think, okay, I'm taking the thousand micrograms B12, but I'm only absorbing 10, it's, it's really like, like taking 10 as far as the effect on the body. So the passive absorption that 1% absorbs regardless of intrinsic factor, it will happen if you've had gastric bypass, it will happen if you've had, uh, uh, if you have no stomach acid, which is normally needed to help produce intrinsic factor. That intrinsic factor only helps you absorb about three micrograms, maybe a little less. But this is a Cochrane database systemic review, which is one of the most authoritative medical reviews there is. In clinical trials, daily oral consumption of a doses of at least 1,000 microgram are as effective as intramuscular injections that are given by according to medical protocols. In other words, doctors can substitute someone taking 1,000 micrograms a day of B12, and it's as, as effective as if they went to the doctor and got shots. Now, there are two active forms of B12 in the body, and many people do not understand that. They have been told the opposite, in fact. Methylcobalamin is one of the active forms, and we certainly sell that. And that's a common form that a lot of stores think, this is the active form, this is the one I need to take. The other form is adenosylcobalamin, also known as dibenkozide, especially in sports products. And they have totally separate mechanisms. If you take uh, just plain B12 from the diet or hydroxycobalamin, which is an injectable form, some of it will be methylated and go into this pathway. Some of it will not be methylated and go into this pathway. This uses the methyltransferase enzyme. This uses the methylmalonyl coenzyme A mutase enzyme. They are totally separate systems in the body doing different things. And if you take one form, you're not gonna have the benefits of the other form. Adenosylcobalamin or dibenkozide is used by the mitochondria. It's used for energy. And about two thirds of the active B12 in the body is this non-methylated form. It is the preferential form for energy. Methylcobalamin is the main form for nerve stability, detoxification of homocysteine, brain and nerves. 
So this one is good for certain things and the other form is good for other things. We, so it's not one form in the body, there's two forms in the body. Cyanocobalamin, the, the, the very common uh, supplemental form of B12 will go both ways because it is not difficult to methylate B12 in the body. There, there's not any major metabolic issue with doing that, uh, you know, where there might be for some other nutrients. So methionine synthase requires methionine as a cofactor to convert uh, folic acid basically into uh, to homocysteine and back again. If you have a B12 deficiency, you can accumulate excess homocysteine. It is the methylated form that reduces homocysteine. So it's a cardiovascular risk factor if you don't have the methylated form. So it has a valid role in the body. But the other form, which is really twice as much in the body as the methylcobalamin, is the adenosylcobalamin or dibenkazide. That is necessary for the production of energy from fats and the synthesis of hemoglobin to transport iron in the body. So energy and anemia, that, that stuff is all related to this form of B12, and if you're only taking methylcobalamin, you're not feeding this pathway, which is by volume, the major pathway of B12 in the body. Now I'll mention we do have some formulas that have three forms of B12 in the body. It has cyanocobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, and methylcobalamin. That's true on some of our liquids. That's true on one of our powders. That's true of our 2000 microgram lozenge have all three forms. And actually at home, I bring home the 2000 microgram lozenge with all three forms to feed the energetic pathways as well as the detox pathways. Also, B12 is needed for osteoblast proliferation, bone and dental health. And if there is increased homocysteine that interferes with collagen cross-linking, making not only bones, but arteries more fragile. So B12 is necessary for cardiovascular health as well. Another nutrient men are not getting enough of is potassium. <clears throat> Young men consume only about two thirds of the recommended amount. Most guys are loading up on sodium, which actually increases the need for potassium. And potassium is really best gotten from either powders or foods like potatoes, bananas, avocados, produce are good sources. Pills are limited to 99 milligrams a day, which is a tiny fraction of the RDA. Uh, and that's because of there's one instance in history where a potassium pill exploded in someone's gut and afraid of that happening again, they ban pills containing more than 99 milligrams. Uh, that's not a problem with liquids or powders. You can get higher strengths in those forms. So look at the sports products for potassium supplementation more than pills like tablets or capsules to get an effective amount. And another nutrient men are not getting enough of is iodine. Processed foods may not use iodized salt. Iodized salt may not contain as much iodine as recommended. Eggs, milk, and seafoods are good sources, but if you're not getting uh, a multivitamin containing iodine or seafoods uh, or iodized salt in abundant amounts, not non-iodized salt like they might use in, in prepared foods, uh, there might be a risk of not enough iodine for thyroid health, but also immune health. I mean, there are iodine receptors on the prostate and in breast tissue. So iodine has a role well beyond thyroid. And for thyroid function, the two main nutrients are not only iodine, but the amino acid L-tyrosine. And they're used to build the thyroid hormones, the two of those nutrients are incorporated into thyroid hormones. This is just the process of using enzymes to separate them and 
uh, they're used to make a scaffolding. Enzymes cut out the hormones from the scaffold. The scaffolding is broken down with enzymes and the nutrients recycled, whatever's left there. So let's look at specifically at some ingredients and products. Fibulus is a popular product. Uh, there are two main components we look for on labels, uh, the saponins and some of the specific saponins. The one you'll find on some labels is protodiacin. Uh, protogracillin is not typically seen on labels. They work to convert testosterone into dehydrotestosterone, which helps with not only sex drive, but production of red cells from bone marrow, muscular development, blood circulation, op oxygen transport systems, et cetera. Now, it's suggested that it does this by affecting the pituitary gland rather than directly affecting the production of sex hormones in the sex glands. And that's important because men and women can both take something like tribulus by stimulating the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland will tell the body to make the appropriate sex hormones for that person rather than it's always gonna be testosterone. It might be supporting the production of estrogen in women, for example. So. A lot of these things that we think are men's nutrients may be women's nutrients too, because they're working at a higher level than the sex organs. So we, we've got the Tribulus products here. Uh, they might help healthy endocrine function and male reproductive health. Obviously, we're slanting this product for men's health, and that's where mostly who's going to use it but that doesn't mean it's not appropriate in some women's formulas as well. And there's a couple formulas here. This is the tablet. And you can see they're standardized to saponins on both of these products. We have Tribulus Extreme, which actually has standardization to uh, a more specific compound, the protodiacin that I mentioned earlier. This also has the organic raw maca root extract from Peru, the horny goat weed, the green tea extract, damiana and ashwagandha. And again, the maca root can be used by men or women. Uh, uh, while this is marketed for men's health and primarily people using it might be men, it's not necessarily exclusive to men. I would not hesitate to offer this to a woman who needed some hormonal support, for example, you know, even though it's not a labeled claim. Now the maca, we're using the six to one gelatinized maca uh, is the one I'm pointing out. It's gelatinized means uh, gelatin refers to protein in, in laboratory sense. So it means it's uh, removing the starch and concentrating the protein using a cold process. So this men using this product for 1.3 to 3 grams daily for four months increase their semen volume, sperm count, and sperm motility in healthy men of reproductive age. And uh, in terms of libido, that same kind of dose for 12 weeks increased subjective feelings of sexual desire in healthy men, again, age 21 to 57. So we're seeing effects on libido as well as at least a potential of helping fertility. And this is the organic raw maca product. It does come in both a powder and a capsule. So it's, it's like taking a lot of the maca. And this is actually specific types. If, if you call our product information team, they'll tell you it's like, you know, eight, what percent of it is, is the black and, and brown and yellow uh, forms of maca? There are certain percentages in this, this particular material. So this is actually a fairly well-documented uh, maca product. We've, there's also the ginsengs, and we did discuss ginsengs previously that's posted on our webpage, the, uh, looking at the herbs category 
And uh, there's a three part training and part one talks about adaptogens, which includes specifics about the ginsengs. Ginsengs are used in the Orient to improve mental and physical vitality, to fight fatigue and stress, support adrenal glands, and giving more oxygen to muscles. So both Asian and American ginseng are uh, forms of true ginseng, Panax products is the Latin name. Eleuthero, which was formerly known as Siberian ginseng, has similar properties, but it's not a true ginseng. Saw palmetto extract. Uh, saw palmetto is typically from uh, a berry that's grown in Florida. And there are studies showing safe and effective use of those preparations to support the prostate's structures and functions. And typically they're standardized to fatty acids, 85 to 95% fatty acids or plant sterols is another way you might see them labeled. If you get a dry form instead of a soft gel or liquid, they spray this on a starch and it cuts the dose at least in half. So a saw palmetto extract in a dry form is not going to be as strong as this. 320 milligrams of saw palmetto extract standardized to over 85% fatty acids or sterols is the clinical standard. In fact, me being an old man, I take one of these every day with a meal. And there's a base of pumpkin seed oil in here as well. We have the Atom Multiples. It comes in tablet, capsule, and soft gel forms. Uh, the tablet is labeled as a one-a-day formula. And these are the nutrients in the tablet. I'm actually gonna show you a comparison of the three formulas in a minute. So not gonna dwell on this, but you could see these are the vitamins that have daily values. Below this bar are the nutrients in the formula that do not have daily values including vitamin K2, by the way. K2 got demoted recently, so it no longer appears with the regular vitamin K up here. And they're now separated on labels because the FDA no longer believes K2 is an essential nutrient. And if you notice the specific non-nutrient formulas in here, the, the non-essential nutrients, we do not include things that tweak hormones a lot. You're not seeing tribulus, you're not seeing uh, horny goat weed. Some brands will use those kind of things in there, we do not. Uh, we are supporting men's health. Uh, lycopene is specific for men's health and prostate, for example. Saw palmetto, this is the berry, which is not the extract. Uh, you know, We're trying to support men's health in a different way here, uh, that you don't have to worry about hormonal effects. We also have it in a capsule form, a three a day, a similar formula. And all three of these formulas are iron free, by the way. Here's the soft gels, which, in, and, and actually, uh, I helped formulate these products. The soft gel is the best of the three. It is not vegetarian, though, so I can't take it. But it does have the berry extract, it's, it's half of a clinical dose in, in a multivitamin, that's pretty good. We have the plant sterols, uh, we have a pumpkin seed oil base. So, you know, this is a nice formula. We have even more lycopene. Lycopene has a role in prostate health and is in our prostate formulas we'll talk about in a minute as well. And we have the men's extreme sports multiple, which includes ZMA that I mentioned earlier, MCT oil, plant sterols, herbal extracts, and this is that formula. You see MCT oil is most of the base, which actually helps you absorb fat-soluble nutrients. This one has the ZMA and the tribulus and some of the, the maca, some of these other things in there. So it's a little different from the atom formulas in that regard. And this compares all four formulas on a chart. And I can't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, when you go across, here's your vitamin A in all four formulas, et cetera. Here's your folate in all four formulas. Here's your B12 in all four formulas, et cetera. So you could see that uh, there's some similarities and some differences on these. 
and looking at the minerals separately, I, I couldn't fit them all on one page. Uh, you could see that these formulas are fairly similar. The tablets being a one a day are, are lower strength on a lot of these. But all of them are free of iron, as I mentioned. And that's the vitamins and minerals. When you look at the miscellaneous things in there, your saw palmetto, uh, here's aloe, which sometimes helps absorption and tolerability of multivitamins. And here's things that are in the sports multi that are not in the other products that are tacked on at the bottom here. Now, prostate is a key target of nutrients for men. It's part of the male reproductive function. It produces fluid for semen, which transports sperm. It's in front of the rectum and behind the bladder. It's normally about the size of a chestnut. So the bladder empties through the prostate and then goes down into, uh, in the case of men, the, the penis, and they, you can urinate. But since the tube from the bladder goes through the prostate, if the prostate gets swollen, it could pinch that tube and not allow the bladder to completely empty. And that results in problems for men. So this is just more anatomy on there. I don't think we need to get into great detail here. So we have formulas like clinical strength prostate health. And this is a formula I worked on as well. Uh, it's an enhanced formula compared to the original prostate support, which still is a product. It has saw palmetto, lycopene, and beta cetosterol at potencies comparable though, to those used in clinical trials. In other words, clinical strength, saw palmetto, beta cetosterol, and lycopene, plus plant sterols, turmeric, quercetin, free radical scavenging herbs, etc. You can see it's a base of pumpkin seed oil. We're going up from uh, one to three milligrams of lycopene to 10 milligrams of lycopene here. You got your pomegranate extract. You've got phytosterols here, stinging nettle root. The leaf is used for respiratory health. The root is used for prostate. And of course, we've got vitamin D. This was the first prostate formula to incorporate vitamin D and recognize there are vitamin D receptors on the prostate gland. We have the uh, zinc and selenium in there as well. So prostate support uh, typically is gonna use these strong saw palmetto extracts. Uh, they have specific ways that they affect uh, maintaining healthy hormonal status, immune system status, relaxing the prostate muscle. Lycopene is associated with healthy prostate structure function. We have the regular prostate support, which is a similar formula, but much simpler formula. It does not have the, the same nutrients. It, it's got lower strength of saw palmetto berry extract. It's got lower strength of lycopene. It does not have the plant sterols, et cetera. And when we wanna compare the formulas, you can see there's a lot more nutrients in the clinical strength. And some of these nutrients are stronger, significantly stronger in the clinical strength product. Men's virility powder includes horny goatweed, myrpalma, maca, and tribulus. Uh, Male performance is the, one of the goals of this product. It's based on the horny goat weed with Murapalma, Maca, Tribulus, Hanex Ginseng, Damiana, and uh, some Ginkgo and Cayenne to help with circulation. Then we have several Testojack formulas. Testojack 100, 200, and 300. The, the Testojack 100 has ZMA, LJ100, a trademark form of long jack, and tribulus in there. So formulated to maintain reproductive function, libido, and sexual performance. And here's the formula. There's a little B6 in there to help with metabolism as well. So this is a trademark form that's standardized to a specific fraction. 
of uh, the long jack, the LJ100. And it includes zinc as well, and B6 magnesium. Now here's a study that we performed. Uh, this was done uh, the way we designed studies. We had our MD on staff design the study. We had an outside MD review it uh, for ethical reasons. And we had volunteers from the company. In this case, it was a single male volunteer. They took TestoJack 100 to a day for four weeks and increased by 20%, 25% their total and free plasma testosterone levels, where it maintained them within a healthy range, but it significantly increased them by 25% after four weeks of supplementation without going into the danger zone. So it's a very limited study, obviously, with one adult male, but it did show the product was effective in supporting uh, higher but still healthy levels of te testosterone in the body. Now, Testodac 200 is a little different. This is an all botanical formula, and it does not use a trademark form of Long Jack, Tonkat Ali. So this one has tribulus, maca, and horny goatweed along with the Tonkat Ali. It, we had both American and Panax ginseng and Mura Palma. So the 200 is 200 milligrams of this particular extract. It is not standardized to the same thing as the LJ100, which is 100 to one extract. But this has the organic maca, a oh, nice dose there, by the way. Uh, the epimedium and the horny goatweed, the tribulus, you're, you're both forms of, of true ginsengs and the Mura Palma, so very nice formula. If you're not looking for the trademark LJ100 or the magnesium zinc B6. So that's this formula. And then we have the Pestojack 300, which is simply 300 milligrams of the Tonkat Ali, a standalone, just a single herb extract. Now, we also did a study with two healthy male volunteers with TestoJack 300, and we showed the total plasma testosterone and the free plasma testosterone increasing uh, with both of these volunteers. The free plasma testosterone had a much stronger rise in both volunteers than the total plasma testosterone, but that's, that's, that's not a bad thing. So total testosterone increased 64% for one and 17% above baseline for the other volunteers, which you see in here. The, on the chart on the left, there's a, a smaller increase, but still a, a good increase on uh, one of the volunteers, but much stronger in the other. And both of them had uh, 59 or 62% increase of free testosterone, very similar numbers in that. And here's a comparison of those men's formulas. Your horny goat weeds in a couple of them, your mer palmas in some. Uh, you have maca root versus gelatinized maca root, which is a stronger extract. Your tribulus is different in some of these. So it, it's a little comparison of, of the formulas. Uh, you know, there's reasons why people might take one over the other. And horny goat weed extract, which is just the epimedium uh, extract with maca root. So we we fill the cap with maca root, just so there's a couple of nice things in there for men. And uh, I want to conclude by talking about soy and whether it's safe. Uh, this is uh, nutrition reviews. Uh, the current literature supports the safety of isoflavones as consumed in diets based on soy or containing soy products. This is a study that was done at uh, various universities in the United States and UK. And this was done about three years ago, an updated expanded meta-analysis, regardless of dose, regardless of study duration, Neither soy protein nor isoflavone exposure affected total testosterone, free testosterone, estradiol, or estrone levels in men. 
There were no significant effects of soy protein or isoflavone intake on any of these outcomes measured. Sub-analysis of data according to isoflavone dose and length of the study also showed no effect. So soy is safe for men, and uh, you know that's something that uh, Mayo Clinic and, and various other uh, authorities have said as well. American Cancer Society. But interestingly enough, beer is a relevant source of estrogen for men. For women, the exposure is lower, but it's still relevant. They're also finding estrogen in bottled water, contributing 40 to 47 percent of the estrogen levels. Beverages could be a relevant source of estrogen like compounds in the daily diet and estrogens in plastics for bottled water could be a concern. And that's much more a concern than soy in the diet. So a word to the wise for men and women that uh, bottled water, if you're not using stainless steel and if you're not using well-filtered water, there might be a concern that estrogen would be in the water from either the water source itself, if it's not a clean source, like a lot of waters are municipal drinking water that is filtered. Uh, basically the same water they carbonate and use to make sodas is filtered uh, municipal tap water is also used to make the common bottled waters. If you get a spring water, it's not gonna have the same sourcing. So it's likely to be cleaner. So that concludes my presentation on nutrition for men supplementing a balanced diet. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you. Very helpful in my opinion. Thank you, Neil. Good, good information. And I did hear it from you about the um, sun. I always try to, I, for a while I couldn't remember, is it when your shadow's longer or shorter? So I just remember shadow shorter, no vitamin, or shadow shorter vitamin D. So that's my little, uh, right. my little mantra. The way to, yeah, the way to visualize that is the, the atmosphere is very shallow. And, you know, you know what is it, a, a few miles tall? And the sunlight coming directly down comes through less atmosphere than if it comes at a shallow angle and might come through two, three, four times as much of the air and the air where it's thicker. The shallower the sun, the, the more atmosphere is filtering it. So okay. long shadow means, I mean, if you, if you think you wanna go out at noon typically to get the most sun and the most vitamin D, the sun's more overhead at noon. So sun lower in the sky, less vitamin D, sun higher in the sky, more vitamin D. Well, I live in the sunshine state, so I always try to remember when I'm making vitamin D. So, people so. in Canada get more sunlight exposure than people in Hawaii, Florida, or Spain. Wow. Or, or the Middle East. Just because, because they're more they, active? They, they're active and they seek the sun. Okay. And they will travel to where the sun is if necessary. And, you know, People in Florida, oh, the sun's out, I better not burn. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you go early enough, um, yeah, it's okay. So, And just remember, you'll receive a copy of this um, in your email about an hour after we end the presentation. So go back once you have that link and review it again, just to be able to digest it all. And thank you once again, Neil. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to do these trainings. My pleasure. Nice to be with you all in, in spirit, if not uh, in person. Thanks, Neil. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll uh, catch you next month. Bye-bye.